Hi everyone, this is uh, the first video in Unit 2 where we're going to really start talking about atomic structure. Now, it's kind of interesting because in terms of this unit itself, um, we really only have these two learning outcomes um, that I'm going to address in this video. Specifically, we're going to look at atomic structure. We're going to determine both the atomic number, the mass number, and really just figure out how many of each subatomic particle um, are present both in an atom and in an isotope. Well, in an isotope and an ion. And so if you look at the overall outline for this unit, I'm just going to be spending time here. Now, technically, I could probably cover this in a slide or two, but I kind of like knowing the background. And so I'm actually going to include some more information about how do we know what we know. And so chemistry really dates back to ancient Greece, um, where it was more alchemy than true science. And so the first way that we really described matter was by the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And it really uh, was primitive. But they were able to identify um, some elements and some compounds. Um, specifically, they used some acids and other things. But if you look at how they made, um, you know, bronze and they used other things in their day-to-day uh, -day lives, it, it, it was a good start. And so really, um, our modern chemistry didn't begin until the 1700s, um, and really Robert Boyle is given most of the credit for being the first chemist. Now, it all came about um, after some experiments with Boyle and um, a few others. Charles Dalton came up with an atomic theory, and in that theory, he said that all matter is made of these small indestructible particles called atoms. He kind of viewed them like um, marbles. They were homogenous, they were solid, um, and he thought that every atom of an element is going to be identical. Different element, dif they would be different. Whenever you had more than one element bond together, you would get a compound, and those compounds were always going to have the same number and type of atoms. Um, and that came about from some really interesting gas ex gas phase experiments, but we don't really talk about that until much later. And then chemical reactions would involve some kind of change to the atom, whether it was um, how they were bonded um, or if how they were arranged, but the atom themselves wouldn't be really changed. What we know today is a little bit different. Um, if we consider how we view matter, we can kind of look at it this way. Um, we no longer think that atoms are the smallest part of matter. We know that there's protons and neutrons and electrons. We also know that they are not indestructible. They are divisible because we know about the protons and neutrons. They're also destructible because we know about atom bombs and we know about um, radio act, uh, radioactive isotopes. Um, we also know that elements of a given element can't be identical because there's a thing called isotopes, and we're about to discuss those. But yeah, sure, atoms of different elements are different. Compounds mean there's more than one type of atom bonded there. Um, and I don't know where this one is. It should be like that. Uh, law of definite proportions holds here. H2O is always going to be water, stuff like that. And then chemical reactions can rearrange atoms, um, but they may actually change the atom themselves. There we go. Now, if you think back to Dalton's theory, uh, his first theory really said that atoms were solid, homogeneous, indestructible, kind of like marbles. And so J.J. Thompson wanted to test that theory. And so the way they did that is with cathode ray tubes. Um, this is just a vacuumed tube. Um, 
And what he did is he hooked it up to voltage, you know, kind of like a car battery where you have the one end over here, the one end over here, and so positive end, negative end. And what it would happen is by connecting the electricity, the voltage traveled towards the positive electrode, and then he could actually put a magnet. And so if he put a magnet like here, what would happen is it would um, veer slightly. There we go. And so what it ended up showing is that the electron um, inside electricity had a charge. Okay. So also looking at the fact that this was not going straight up, it was just a veering, there's also mass. And so he was able to prove that there are something inside an atom. It's not just that atom is the smallest thing. There's something inside the atom um, that had to be um, charged. Now, if you look, what they were able to do is show that there's going to be elect the electron which has a negative charge and if there's something that's negative we're not walking around shocking each other so really there's got to be something that's a positively charged particle as well now the idea is it doesn't do us any good to know hey there's a particle with a charge and a mass we want to know well, what is that mass and so um, Millikan wanted to let me go ahead and make this smaller Millikan wanted to end up uh, showing what the mass, what the charge is. And if you kind of go through your supplemental reading, what's interesting to me is they always show this experiment as if it was like a really tiny thing. This was a whole room. I mean, this is, it wasn't really a microscope so much as a telescope. And it was a really big chamber. And so what they did is they had uh, some oil and they used a really fine spray to try and get really tiny droplets of oil. Then they irradiated it with electrons, which is just beta radiation. The idea was each drop should have one electron. And then because anything with mass is going to fall because, you know, gravity, um, what would happen is as these fell, they decided to put a uh, magnetic field down here. And so you have a positive charge, electrons are negatively charged, so negative positive um, would attract. Um, so what they ended up doing is having a nice negative, negative, negative would repel, and you could actually watch the electrons come down and kind of bounce up and then go off to the side. Using that they could kind of determine not only um, the charge, the exact charge, not just minus one, but the exact number of columns, the exact voltage of the electron, the exact mass of uh, the electron and the proton. And um, so they were able to really do that here. Now, if you have a positively charged particle, you have a negatively charged particle, there has to be some way that they're existing. And so the first model was developed by J.J. Thompson, um, who did the cathode ray tube a minute ago. And he kind of set this up like plum pudding. Now, we're American. Most of us do not know what plum pudding is. But if you've ever been to like a social with um, specifically grandparents, um, or you've seen uh, Monsters vs. Aliens, there is this jello dessert that Americans tend to experience. Um, it's usually green or some kind of other hideous color. And then what they do is because, you know, it isn't enough to have just green jello, they put um, pieces of pineapple and other fruit in it. Um, so it's pretty similar to this. And so the plum pudding has a very similar texture. It's a pudding that has plum and other things embedded in it, uh, the same as this jello dessert does. Now this dirt dessert, just like the plum pudding, is kind of a model for this atom. The jello portion or the pudding portion is supposed to have some kind of overall 
positive charge, kind of like a positive feeling. And the little particles of pineapple are little negatively charged particles that exist somewhere throughout there. Um, and this is just kind of the first model that they came up with. But just like all other models and theories, you have to test it. So there's this experiment that Rutherford did and he had gold foil and the idea with gold foil is you could hammer it really 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 thin until you basically have it one atom thick. Then they took helium atoms which are much smaller if you look at the periodic table gold is you know so much larger in fact let's go ahead and pull that up keep and so gold is right here. It's got a mass of about a, well, close enough to 200. This is four. And so you're looking at this tiny difference, tiny particle of helium going through. And so you have these gold atoms and you try to throw helium through it. Now, if this model was correct, every time you ran into a particle, it would jump back. And so his theory was, throwing helium through this atom it wasn't going to work. Almost all of the um, particles would bounce right back. But that didn't happen and instead you can kind of see the detector found so many of these helium atoms go straight through the gold they had to reevaluate and so it went from this plum pudding model to an atom that is mostly empty space with a small dense nucleus uh, with a positive charge here. Okay, and so as we talk about the atomic structure, I just kind of like to give, you know, props to the, the scientists that came up with the experiments that figured all this out. And so the current model of the atom that is accepted in high school and college literature textbooks for the moment is that there are three subatomic particles. Now, if you know of the, the research that's being done, that's great, but I'm not going to test you on anything beyond this. So the atom has an electron, proton, and neutron. The electron has a negative charge and orbits somewhere around the nucleus. We're going to get to that in a little bit. Proton and neutron both exist inside that nucleus. Proton has a positive one charge. Neutron has no charge. It's neutral. Now if you look at the mass of these, I'm not going to ask you exactly what the electron is, but I want you to see that the proton and neutron are about 2,000 times bigger than that electron. And so the charge comes from the electron and the proton. The mass comes from the proton and the neutron. And so if we kind of look, this is not drawn to scale obviously, but the idea is the nucleus is about one ten thousandth, or the atom radius is about 10,000 times bigger than the nucleus itself. And so this is really, really small. In fact, that's, that's the nucleus, more like that. And so um, the way that we have this now is we've got neutrons and protons in the nucleus. We have electrons somewhere outside. And the important thing is first, our atomic number, that number of protons does not change for an element. Okay, every element of hydrogen is gonna have one proton. Every atom of helium is gonna have two protons. Lithium is three, beryllium is four, and so on. So not only is this the same for every atom of that element. It's also nice because the periodic table is organized by atomic number. And so we could very quickly say something like, well, how many protons does an atom of phosphorus have? It's always going to be 15. How many protons does iron have? It's always going to be 26. And so you already have that. This is the periodic table that you get on my exams. Uh, you already get the atomic number kind of embedded. In terms of mass number, <coughs> sorry, mass number, remember we said mass comes from protons and neutrons. 
So mass number is just the number of protons and the number of neutrons added together. Now, because neutrons can change, you can have more than one possibility for an element. And that's at any time you change the number of neutrons, you get a different isotope. And so, for example, there's carbon 12 and carbon 14. Now, if you look at the periodic table, carbon always has six protons. And so when we write an isotope, let me see, yeah, when we write an isotope, um, on the periodic table, you have the atomic number on top, the mass, atomic mass on the bottom. This is not a whole number, it's not mass number, it's the atomic mass that we deal with later. When we write an isotope, the atomic number should come down on the bottom, and that's just the number of protons. The mass number, which is the protons plus neutrons, goes on the top. Um, occasionally you'll see it also written as like C-14, but the preferred way is like this. Now personally, I don't care if you have just C-14 or C-14 with the 6 down there to indicate the atomic number. Either one is fine, but I prefer the 14 to be a superscript. Okay. Now, uh, as we're working on this, if we know the atomic number is 6, we know the mass number, we can very quickly find all kinds of other things. Because this is P plus N, this is the number of protons, we know carbon-14 has 6 protons, 14 minus 6, this is N plus P, and this is P, so it means we have 8 neutrons. Okay, now you can really look at these isotopes in even more depth if you consider the charge. Now, we know that the charge comes only from protons and neutrons. And so if they're, I mean, sorry, protons and electrons. If it's neutral, these have to be equal. And so if you go back to here, this has got hydrogen has one proton. It's also going to have one electron if it's neutral. Uh, helium, two protons, two electrons. And so because there's no charge indicated here, the number of positives and the number of negatives have to be equal. And so if we know that we have six protons and it's got a zero charge overall, we also have to have six electrons. So if we look at oxygen, now technically guys, oxygen, any element that you're really talking about is going to be lowercase if it's in the middle of a sentence, capitalized only if it's at the beginning of a sentence, just like anything else at the beginning of a sentence, okay? And so if we look at oxygen, we go back up here. Oxygen is atomic number eight, which means it has eight protons. Now, we don't specify here how many electrons, so we could assume that it's neutral. But it, so it should be eight, positives and negatives. But if it's got 10 neutrons, that means our atomic number is eight. Mass number is protons plus neutrons, which is eight plus, oops, you guys can't see that. 8 plus 10 or 18. And so this would be 18 is the mass number and that would be the symbol of oxygen. Now again, I really don't care if you include this atomic number or not. Um, either way is acceptable as long as the mass number is indicated. So if we look at the atomic, an element with the atomic number of 14, mass number of 29, 
we know mass is going to be 29. This is going to be 14. We just have to go to the periodic table and find the element that's got atomic number 14. And that's going to be silicon. So we're going to come back down here. Where did I go? And that would be it. Now if we look at protons, neutrons, and electrons, we know that the number of protons is 14 because that's the atomic number on the periodic table. Neutrons, this is P plus N, and this is P. So to find N, you just subtract 14 from 29, and you get 15. This is neutral, so protons and electrons have to be the same, so it ends up being 14. An element X2 contains 20 protons, 21 neutrons. What's the atomic number and mass number? Atomic number is just the number of protons, so that's going to be 20. Mass number is going to be P plus N, or 20 plus 21, so it's going to be 41. <coughs> now, again, we can figure out which element this is because it tells us the number of protons. It gives us that atomic number. And so if we go to periodic table, number 20 is calcium. And so we can write this as calcium 41. If you want to, you can write your 20 here, 2 plus. Now, here's an interesting side note, guys. So this is protons, this is neutrons. In terms of electrons, our overall charge here is two positive. So we looked at the protons, we've got 20 positives. In terms of electrons, we really only have 18. The, that's the only way that we can get an overall charge of two plus. 20 minus 18 gives us two plus, okay? Um, so there's 18, proton, uh, 18 electrons here. Now, guys, the other thing I want to point out, yeah, 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 is as you are looking at this, try not to get bogged down with the fact that, you see how this is 40.08? And down here, we have 41. It's not going to be the same as on the periodic table. The periodic table is atomic mass. We are dealing with mass number. The mass number should be a whole number. It's just protons plus neut neutrons, and you're not going to have half of a proton or half of a neutron. It's going to be a whole number here. We deal with atomic mass in a later unit, but remember that mass number can change. There we go. So remember in terms of ions, cations are going to be positively charged ions. The only way I remember this is, um, well, some people like cats and think they're kind of nice. Um, I like cats, they just don't like me. You can only form a positive ion, you can only form a cation by losing electrons. The number of protons can't change. Anions are much easier to remember antagonistic, annoying, of a lot of the negative connotation words start with an. So anions are negatively charged ions and you can only form a negative ion by gaining electrons. Again, protons cannot change. So when the number of neutrons changes, you have an isotope. The number of electrons changes, you have an ion. So what's the symbol for an ion with 12 protons and 10 electrons? Well, here we've got 12 positives and 10, uh, 10 negatives. Overall, we've got to have a 2 plus charge. So we've got to have 2 plus. We know that this is going to be a 12. We don't know the mass number here, so we can't write that in. But let's go see what has atomic number. 12. It should be magnesium.
and so this is going to be magnesium 2 plus. If we look at something with nine protons, nine protons, ten electrons, nine positives, ten negatives, overall we have a one minus charge. Again, if we go back to that periodic table, remember you guys get this on the exam. Where'd it go? There we go. Nine is fluorine. So as we go to write this, we're going to have F. Again, we don't have the mass number, so we just know it's got a negative charge up here. Okay? You do have some practice in my open math, so hopefully that will help.